There's one thing we certainly can do here is we can, we can raise the roof a bit, can't we? Because we can make a noise. <laughs> um, and I think it's a joyful noise unto the Lord, isn't it? It's always good to sing praises to the Lord. You know, I was thinking just as we were um, beginning to, uh, starting our service and, and progressing with it, um, that if you look at our website, the, the church here seeks to be Christ-centered. It seeks to be Bible teaching and it seeks to be community reaching. That's really, in a sense, uh, our mission, if you like, um, and that's what we're aiming to be. And you know, we are Christ-centered because you see, we come together every week and we remember the Lord, don't we? It's so important for a church to keep Christ at the center. That's absolutely crucial because Christianity is about one person and that's Jesus Christ. That's the key. So we keep Christ at the center. We remember him in praise and worship, in breaking of bread, uh, and we uh, must keep the emphasis there. You know, over the years, I've been to different churches. I've traveled around. I've preached in different places. And you see how ch different churches do different things. Uh, and over the years, I've noticed some churches I have go to, the focus has moved away maybe from Christ to mission. And they're all about mission, and it's all about mission. And all the prayers are about mission. And other churches I've been to, it's all about the persecuted church. And their prayers are all about the persecuted church. And that, and that, and that. And yet, sometimes, you know, I've been in churches and the name of Jesus Christ has hardly been mentioned. Well, we need to make sure that doesn't happen here, don't we? <laughs> we need to keep Christ at the center in our praise, in our adoration, in our worship, in our singing. So we're all about Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and that's... Christ Center. The other thing that we do is Bible teaching, and we are delighted that we're able to teach God's Word uh, in the week and also on a Sunday. Uh, and we want to teach the Word rather than teach our own ideas, our own philosophies, our own little stories, our own uh, ways. We want to teach God's Word, and hence why we really want to focus again on Romans. Because Romans is such a critical book for Christians to know, to understand, to rejoice in, to give thanks for. It's an amazing book, and we're going to look at that. But the other thing we do, uh, if you read the website, we're about community reaching. And that is happening as well. And we thank God, don't we, for Dave's uh, production of the leaflets. And then we thank God for everybody who's involved in the distribution. Uh, because all of a sudden, houses in this area are hearing uh, and seeing God's word because we're reaching out to the community. And of course, we're reaching out to the community with the, the ladies uh, on, a, on a Wednesday, uh, and obviously looking for other opportunities to reach out to this community uh, and to serve it and to show the love of Christ and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, because that's the best way to show the love of God, isn't it? Is to tell them about uh, the gospel, the good news of the gospel. So we're going to... Um, carry our, on this study then with Romans. Uh, we're not going to try and get too bogged down uh, in the sense that uh, it's easy, isn't it, to uh, get really bogged into the, into the detail. And, and we're trying to, trying to avoid that um, as best we possibly can. Um, and what I want to do is just sort of give a bit of an introduction to Romans. We're not going to get very much into chapter one, but I want to, do, I want to read from chapter one, if we may. Um, Romans is a critical book. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's God's plan to restore fallen humanity back to himself. This is how God is going to do it. Okay? Man fell in the Garden of Eden, and he's been separated from God. Man, humanity's been separated from God since then. But here in Romans is how God works about this process of restoring man to himself. And we're going to talk about what it is to be justified. We're going to talk about what it is to be sanctified and also what it is to be glorified. And those ideas are all coming out of the book of Romans. So let's read Romans chapter 1. And we'll read from the first verse. I'm reading from the NLT. I'm doing that on purpose because I think it's a fresh uh, way of, of putting it across. Maybe you wouldn't have heard it this way before, but it's helpful. This letter is from Paul a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into David's family line. 
And he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them, so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. And you are included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. I am writing to you all in Rome who are loved by God and are called to be his holy people. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of your faith in him. It is being talked about all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news about his son. One of the things I always pray for is, the oppor- is for the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. For I long to visit you so I can bring some spiritual gift that will, be a help, that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit, just as I have seen among other Gentiles. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and the uneducated alike. So I am eager to come to you in Rome, too, to preach the good news. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. And then that passage goes on to talk about the anger of God against the sin of humanity. Uh, And he outlines uh, some of the sins that we see in our world today. And it shows that God is angry at the sin of humanity and, of course, will punish the sin of humanity unless, of course, we come into the good of the salvation of God that comes to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we know the forgiveness of sins, and we know what it is to be brought back to God, and that, of course, is what the good news of the gospel is all about. It's how we, sinful human beings, can be restored to him in righteousness and holiness. Sometimes when I'm speaking to people uh, about um, the gospel, It all starts with this problem of sin, Um, and it does in Romans. And Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3 look at three people, a person who's a right sinner, a real sinner, a real rogue, declares him to be a sinner. A person who's respectable and looks down on the person who's a real sinner, thinking he's better, shows he's a sinner. And then a person who's religious, who looks down on those two others, and Romans says, no, he's a sinner as well. And it concludes this, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So put your hand up this morning if you've never told a lie. So I went to one church once and there was a little lad who was sat on the front row and he shot his hand up and he said, I never told a lie. I said, you just have. You see, we're all sinners. Every single one of us in this room are sinners. And therefore, Romans is applicable for every single one of us. We need Romans. We need to understand the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this is why we're going to concentrate on it. Um, My eyesight is getting very poor, but can you see the words on there? Sorry, this is a bit of an eye test, isn't it, this morning? Basically, the author of the book of Romans, without question, is the Apostle Paul. An apostle is someone who's chosen by Christ to declare God, to declare Christ. 
uh, and he was appointed by God and given this special uh, uh, mission to declare the truth of God, the righteousness of God. There are no apostles alive today. There are no apostles alive today. They were there for the foundation of the church, but they're not here today. The date of writing was about AD 65, and it was written from Corinth, uh, and it was written for the church of Rome, the church of Jesus Christ that met in Rome. And by definition, those Christians were Gentiles. So the Bible talks about Jews who are of the nation of Israel, and it talks about Gentiles. If you're not Jewish this morning, then you are a Gentile, okay? <laughs> uh, so just, just so you know that, uh, there we are. Next slide, please. Thank you. So there's something for you to have a read of. Um, basically, it, it outlines for us something of Romans. Romans is a classic. To the unsaved, it offers a clear exposition of their sinful, lost condition and God's righteous plan for saving them. Okay, that's the first thing that Romans does. So for someone who's not saved, for someone who recognizes they're a sinner, they're lost, the Bible's definition of someone who isn't saved is lost, they recognize their lost condition before a holy, righteous God, and Romans is the book that will tell you how you can get right with God. The God who's been offended by your sin, by your wrongdoing. New believers learn of their identification with Christ and of victory through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Romans tells us how we can be right with God, reconciled to God, and then it tells us how we can live in the good of what it is to be saved. And that is what we've been looking at the last three weeks when we've been looking at baptism. Our identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And therein, the understanding of that truth is the key to a victorious Christian life. I don't know whether you've ever tried to live the Christian life, and you just seem to fail. You just seem to get it wrong. <laughs> you know, you maybe go a few days and you manage to do it okay, and you're okay, and then, then oh no, you slip again. You slip again. And you know, Romans addresses that problem. Romans chapter 7 describes that problem about the person who's saved, born again of the Spirit of God, and yet they're trying to live their Christian life in whose strength? Their own strength. And because they're trying to live the Christian life in their own strength, they keep failing, and tripping up, and sinning and sinning and sinning. And Romans 7 tells us, Paul says there, the good that I would, I don't do. That which I would, that which I would not, that I do. In other words, I, I want to do good, but I don't do it. Instead, I do bad. And he says this, he declares to himself, oh, wretched man that I am, who deliver me from this body of sin? I don't know whether you feel like that sometimes. Ah, oh, man, <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm a wretched man. And we think to ourselves, there's more to Christian life than this, surely. <laughs> Struggling along, keeping letting the Lord down with my temper, with my words, with my thoughts, whatever it is. Keep letting the Lord down, keep letting the Lord down. You think there's got to be more to the Christian life. There is. And the key is found in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. And it's the understanding of our identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's understanding that we just cannot live this Christian life in our own strength. But rather, we need Christ. And Christ in us is the hope of glory. Christ in us is the only way we're going to live this Christian life. We can't do it in our own strength. We just can't do it. So we've got to move from trying to, what's the other word that begins with T? trusting we move from trying to trusting and Romans 6 7 and 8 deals with that anyway uh, let's move on then of course it says here mature believers find never-ending delights in its wide spectrum of Christian truth doctrinal and prophetical and practical and really the book of Romans is an incredible book it's amazing it's deep 
uh, profound. It's all there. I uh, thank God for it. It's been a blessing for me in my own life and continues to be, and it needs to continue to be, uh, rest assured. Let's move on to look at some of the points uh, that we have. I'm sorry, these are PowerPoint by, uh, you know, by death or whatever it is they call it these days, you know, all the key points there. Um, what are the points? So Romans is the most orderly account of the work of God in the life of an individual. Romans is, uh, I don't know whether that's possible to blow that up. Can people see that or is it a bit, uh, a bit difficult to see? Yeah, a bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know whether you want to try and, try and change it, but let me read the points anyway. So it's the most orderly account of the work of God in the life of an individual. Number two, it's essential for every believer to read and understand. Now, I'm not going to embarrass you, <laughs> but I'm inclined to say, put your hand up if you have never read the book of Romans. <laughs> Listen, it's only for 16 chapters, um, and uh, it doesn't take long to read, uh, and my advice to you would be to read it once, and then read it twice, and then read it three times, and then read it four times, and five times, and six times, and just keep reading it. Because, you know, when we repeatedly read the Word of God, God starts to reveal truth to us through His Holy Spirit. It's very rare we get from Scripture what we need first time through. You know, five minutes in the morning. Yep, done it, gone. No, you need to set time aside. Um, I reckon it take you a couple of hours to read Romans. Just read it through. Just read it through. Read it through and let it sink in. Uh, number three, it contains the secrets to living the Christian life in power and victory. It really does. You wonder why you can't live your Christian life in power and victory? You wonder why you keep failing, keep letting the Lord down? Why your struggle, your Christian life is a struggle? You think to yourself, oh, surely there's more to it than this. <laughs> well, Romans is the key. It outlines for us the power and the victory that comes to us through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Number four, it brings liberty and purpose and power. It brings liberty and purpose and power. And that is so very true. And it starts, Romans starts with the doctrine of the gospel, if you like. Okay? The doctrine of of the gospel. Now, generally speaking, oh, that's a bit better, isn't it? Thank you for that. Um, generally, when we talk about uh, doctrine, uh, people go, oh, oh, don't give me the doctrine. Just give me the practice. Just tell me what to do. Don't give me any doctrine. That's too heavy. <laughs> it does me head in that. No, no. It's important that we understand that the practice of our Christian life and the power to live that Christian life comes out of an understanding of the doctrine. That's how the Bible works. You read through the New Testament, you read through the letters that Paul writes, and you will see that there is a reoccurring pattern, as we have in Romans. You will find it in other letters that Paul writes, is that he first of all writes the doctrine, and then from the doctrine, he writes the practice that flows out of that doctrine. Now, if you just leave, learn your Christian life as a set of do's and don'ts, the practice, the rules and regulations that if you do this, you do this, you do this, you're a good Christian. If you live your Christian life like that, well, you're going to struggle. You're going to find it hard to keep going. It's like pushing a bus up a hill. Whereas, if you allow the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth of the doctrine of the gospel, and the doctrine of the Bible, to you, then there's a transformational effect that happens. And all of a sudden, you're understanding why the practice is important. And that understanding makes the practice, once you understand the doctrine, it makes the practice a delight because you understand the purpose of it. And so doctrine is so, so very important. So it's important to take some time to understand what it means to 
be justified by faith, to understand our true standing before a holy God, that is that we are guilty. What shows us that we are guilty? The law. What's the law? There were ten of them. Ten commandments. If you go through those ten commandments and you do a checklist against each one of them, see how you stand up to it, yeah? Go home, do a little exercise. Have you loved God? Have you got God as number one in your heart and life all of the time? Tick or cross. Uh, have you, let's think about some of those things. Have you ever bowed down to images um, and idols? You know, that's one of the commandments. If we bow down to a false image or an idol, we're, we're breaking one of the commandments. Yeah? Have you always honored your parents? I think back to my childhood, um, and uh, my mum used to say to me, Wes, go and, well, she used to call me Wesley, actually. <laughs> um, she said, go and clean your room. I'd go upstairs, and I'd mess around with my toys or whatever I was doing, whatever I was doing, and then she'd say to her, I was, and then I'd be on my way out. And she'd say to me, Wesley, have you cleaned your room? Oh, yes, mum. I hadn't. <laughs> so I told her a lie. Sin, and that, sin number one. I dishonored my parents. Sin number two. And so we find ourselves, as we go through those lists, we, we break these laws. Have you ever told a lie? Of course we have. Have you ever stolen anything? Of course we have. All of us have. I'll let you use a little secret. Sometimes I stand at the clocking machine or near the clocking machine at work <laughs> at the end of the day. Sometimes I'll stand so I'm visible. And sometimes I'll just observe from a distance. And I noticed one or two people who clock out early. And I feel like going up to them and saying, excuse me, you're a thief. <laughs> what? You're calling me a thief? Who are you calling a thief? You. <laughs> Why? Because you've just stolen five minutes of company time. Have you ever taken... An extra few minutes on your break at work. A few more minutes than you should have done. Have you ever done that? Well, if you have, yeah, you see he's got a guilty conscience. <laughs> if you have done that, you have stolen. You've stolen from your employer. So we steal. Have you ever murdered anyone? Well, you know, the Bible says if we have hatred in our hearts, if there's someone who you really detest, oh, can't stand that person, that's, you're guilty of murder. It says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Have you ever committed adultery? And the Bible says, if we look with lust, we've committed adultery. Which of us haven't done that in our lives? Guilty, guilty, guilty. If we were to do the check mark for Wes on here, it'd be crosses all the way down. <laughs> and the law of God condemns Wesley Downs. Wesley, you're guilty. And there isn't a single thing that I can do to change that. I'm a guilty sinner before God. Because the very best that I can do are just like dirty, filthy, smelly, horrible, oily rags to God. In fact, they're an offense to God. That I should come to God and think that I can be good enough to be acceptable to him, I never can. Because his standard is so high. He's so very, very holy. And we fall so very, very fall sh short of that. And the only hope of salvation is outlined for us in the book of Romans. And that is that we are made right with God through faith. F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all, I trust him. The only hope for our redemption, our salvation rests in faith. And we're going to see that. Uh, and, of course, the truth of this, the doctrine of this, brings us into the place where we know liberty and purpose and power. Here's some interesting facts, then. Point number five, Augustine was converted through reading Romans 13, verses 13 to 14. And that was in AD, AD 80, <laughs> 380. Now, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? A long, long time ago. You see, the gospel has been effective since Jesus Christ was here. And it's been saving individuals year after year after year after year after year for the last 2,000 years. Souls are being saved. 
because of the good news of the gospel. Number six, the Protestant Reformation was launched when Martin Luther finally understood the meaning of God's righteousness and that the just shall live by faith. And that was in 1517. You know, the church was in a really bad place then. It was almost as if the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ had been lost in religion and the darkness of religion because it was a Christless, godless, wicked, evil religious system that had come in. And we thank God for someone who, like Martin Luther, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, as God challenged him and convicted him about his own heart and his own sin, and that he recognized that the only way that he could be saved was by faith. Do you know Martin Luther, Luther nearly died because of his fasting to try and get himself right with God? Martin Luther went to some great, great extremes to try and get himself right with God, but they, none of those things did him any good. But imagine the day that came when he suddenly realized that it wasn't by anything that he could do. His fasting was all in vain. Trying to uh, uh, do what he did in a monastery or whatever was all in vain, but that the just shall live by faith and he realized that salvation was by faith through grace, was of grace through faith uh, and not of works. And he was saved and what a difference he made. Number seven, John Wesley. Um, who I'm named after, who was the leader of the Methodist Church, the founder, if you, if you like, of the Methodist Church. He went all everywhere preaching, and John Wesley received assurance of salvation through hearing the preface to Luther's commentary on Romans read in a Moravian house church on Aldersgate in London, in a street in London in 1738. Isn't that amazing? And Wesley was a vicar at this time. He was a clergyman. He was brought up in the Church of England. His mother was a very faithful lady. But he knew nothing of what it was to be saved by grace through faith. And it took a Moravian church, house church, for him to hear the gospel and for him to be saved. Number eight, John Calvin wrote, when anyone understands this epistle, he has a passage open to him to the understanding of the whole scripture. And Romans is such a critical book to understand God's plan for humanity on earth, the plan of salvation. I know it's been a great blessing in my own life. I, I, I love the book of Romans. Uh, I remember reading it in, in my early years and thinking, wow, this is complicated. This is deep. I can't get to grips with this. I can't understand with this. I'm not the most studious of people, studious of people, I'm afraid. Um, and it takes things a long time to sink in with me. Um, but as I've read it over the years, uh, God has spoken uh, into my own life from it. And I've been blessed an awful lot by Charles Price and his teaching on this book as well. Number 10, it is, an, it is one of the essential books of the Bible that every believer should study. Every believer should study. Uh, and it's important. Now then, the uh, book divides up um, in this way. We do have a bit of an outline, I think, down there. Thank you for that. Um, and basically, you've got that doctrinal section, verses 1 to 8, the gospel of God. And we won't go into the specific details there. Then you've got section number 2, which is dispensational, the God and Israel. Uh, and that's chapters 9 to 11. And then, thirdly, you've got... Uh, uh, the uh, gospel lived out, uh, dutiful, uh, dutiful responsibility, the gospel lived out, and that is chapters 12 to 16. And again, that's the doctrine feeding into the practice. So we won't go into any more detail than that. Perhaps we can get that reproduced at some time. But the way in which we want to uh, look at this, um, and with this we finish, the way in which we want to look at this passage or this book is to answer some questions which we think probably is a, a better way to approach it so that um, we've got a really good understanding of, uh, of the book. And we're going to do that by looking at these questions. Um, again, sorry about the size of the text. 
there. And next time I do a PowerPoint for you, I'll make sure that uh, the text needs to be a lot bigger. <laughs> um, so, questions that we're going to address. The first question then is this. What is the subject of the letter? What is the subject of the letter? And you'll find the answers in Romans chapters 1, verse 1, Romans 1, verse 9, Romans 1, verses 15 and 16. What is the subject of this letter? And then the next question we're going to look at is what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Um, and it's important for us to understand that. The word gospel simply means good news. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's more than just good news. It's the sort of good news which is absolutely amazing, which is transformational, which is life-changing. Uh, it's that of that magnitude. And then we're going to think about the um, why do men need the gospel, the good news. And then we're going to think according to the gospel how ungodly sinners can be justified by a holy God. So how can ungodly sinners be made right, the idea of the word justified, be made right with a holy God? We're going to look at that. And then number five, does the gospel agree with the Old Testament? So the Bible is made up of two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Does the New Testament relate or agree with the Old Testament? And of course the Old Testament does and it points to the same person the Lord Jesus think about that question number six what are the benefits of justification in a believer's life chapter 5 verses 1 to 20 number seven does the teaching of salvation by grace through faith permit or even encourage sinful living and that's Romans 6 verses 1 to 23 I remember having a meeting with some guys some years ago now uh, and they said to me, Wes, it's great this grace, isn't it? It's great. It's really good. We're into grace in a big way. Um, and uh, in essence, their understanding of the gospel stopped at chapter 5. Um, and that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And that's as far as they got. And they went on to tell me about some of the things they were doing in their life, the way they were living their life. And they said to me, Wes, you know what? We've discovered it's great to study the Bible when you're smoking weed. Ooh, that was a bit of a shock. I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> they said, oh, it, yeah, it enhances the experience. Um, the only problem was that they hadn't gone on to chapter 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, the answer to that is no. A thousand times no. In other words, no, 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 no. <laughs> Misunderstood the gospel so we need to address that issue don't we because that's one of the criticisms that Paul got about the gospel of grace you're saying Paul that we can just sin and there's no consequence to that ah but the people who think like that have misunderstood the gospel and the work of God in the life of an individual and so we'll look at that and then question number eight what is the relationship to the Christian and the law chapter 7 verses 1 to 25 number nine how is the Christian enabled to live a holy life and that's chapter eight Number, number 10, does the gospel by promising salvation to both Jews and Gentiles mean that God has broken his promises to his earthly people, the Jews? So Romans does have a section there which addresses the Jews. Uh, and then finally, how should those who've been justified by grace respond in everyday lives? What does that look like in our lives? Now we are justified uh, and we are being sanctified, what does that look like? in our everyday practice in the church, in our personal lives, in our home lives, and we'll look at that as well. So there we are. Uh, so those are the questions we're going to work our way through over the coming weeks uh, as we look at this book of 